I think Tryon around Asheville, Black Mountain, Burnsville, and then a number of summers he was around Sevierville and Gatlinburg and Dandridge in Tennessee. The mountains of North Carolina were not the remote region that people have been led to believe over the years because of the hillbilly media-generated view. It was an area that was well-traveled, was talked about and written about from a travel and tourism standpoint from the late 19th century onward. There was a steady stream of the most sophisticated and wealthiest people in America coming to Asheville on a regular basis. Biltmore opened in 1895. The Vanderbilts were very well connected. Those connections led to Asheville. When he came to the mountains, I think he spent the majority of his time painting out of doors. I think that he probably started out in the morning not knowing exactly where he would end up painting, but probably stopped at whatever spot happened to catch his eye, which, judging by his finished work, could be an all-encompassing vista of distant mountain ranges or the trunk of a tree base, um, something very much a microcosm of what he was surrounded by. Uh, either one could catch and hold his attention. Dependent on what I have in mind, I select what seems to me the most appropriate medium, always taking into consideration the external qualities, which, after all, control the way that light is reflected from the surface. It goes without saying that I make my own pigments and use the most suitable vehicle for each occasion. His technical abilities, they're, they're many. You know, color, he had it nailed. I think it was technician, but he was pleased, the outcomes, very pleased. And he was enthusiastic and, and, and interested in discovering what, what really was there to do and how it turned out. His father was a chemist, and I think he inherited some of that uh, chemistry in his paint and how to um, create new colors and new things and it was always inspiring to see what he was going to do next. He came back home for supper and just, oh, I did this and this. You know what that color did? It turned something. He was very pleased. It was fun for him. Sometimes he used tempera and pastel together, and it's very hard. The other thing is he made his own pastel chalks. Uh, he even, uh, during World War II, he even was searching with Mississippi clays and uh, creating formulas. There was even some talk of his doing, of creating uh, his own pastels, which apparently are very durable. And he used an emulsion of some sort, and then at other times he used a fixative over his pastels. But he's an absolute master of pastels uh, and gets strong forms as well as very delicate uh, forms. It's been my experience, and I think the experience of all serious creative artists, if they have the good fortune of working over a long period of time, gradually to depart from the representation of surface appearance and develop symbols expressive of cosmic values. His work began to slowly become abstract. First portions of the work, the sky, the mountain part of the landscape, there would still be buildings and, and flowers that would be very realistic in the foreground, but the sky could be completely fractured in the background. And, this, and you saw over the course of a few years his work going from what would be thought of now as almost trite regionalist view, in a way, to being views that when you look at them you know exactly what you're looking at, but it's only after you've looked at them for five or ten minutes that you really realize that here's an artist that 
that's doing something completely different. All the forms are actually abstracted. Clay was really one of his heroes. And his friends talked about how after he'd seen Clay, it was as if he knew Clay. I mean, that, that he sort of talked about him as a friend. This, this clearly shows his acquaintance with uh, the kind of things that Kandinsky, Bauer, uh, and, and so forth were working. And, and uh, more precise, more uh, sort of studied than, than some of his more subtle relationships. Uh, brilliant use of color. I think he saw the Guggenheim collection, the so-called non-objective art, uh, fairly early on, certainly by the 30s he had seen it. Uh, there, were, there were some exhibits in galleries before the Guggenheim opened, and, and he saw those and was very influenced by both the, the individual paintings and then the ideas behind uh, them. I think because of his academic endeavors and his trips to museums and his conscious trips to look at art in New York and Washington and Cincinnati, I think he had to be conscious of art history. I, I don't think he existed in a vacuum at all. He was too smart of an individual. He was just too intelligent for it not to have been a part of the whole. He had to understand the greater picture. I think it's fair to say at this time that all this whole group of artists in America and the, the feeling that between um, the new discoveries about Freudian and the unconscious and then the scientific discoveries about the atom and the sort of the unconscious in a sense uh, part of the world or what he's uh, what they were interested in and that he's sharing this idea of and they felt that with these two new sciences you in a sense they were going to get a, a truth about the universe Art is based on emotional understanding, a feeling of that which lies back of appearance, and on the creative power to reconstruct in visual or audible terms the artist's feeling and moods. There's always the desire to express the harmonious interconnection of each and every element and create a feeling of wholeness more satisfying than our ordinary experience in time. He worked sort of back and forth, almost rotating between, quote, realistic, then abstract, which meant somewhat simplifying, taking nature's forms and simplifying them, and then non-objective, which meant sort of not trying to record any specific thing, but drawing from your imagination and trying to seek the essence of color and form and harmony. People love to come in here and make assumptions and to assume that all the abstracts were done at one part in his life and all the representational in another. Within these abstract and non-objective works, there are some that are sort of like an explosion of form and color and water and so forth. There are others that seem to present a sort of faceted layers almost of, of images with sort of interesting slashes of light. Others are very biomorphic, sort of round, amoeba-like forms, exaggerated. Others are when he seems to be trying to get at what he called a cosmic vision of like a sort of floating form with tendrils on the side perhaps, or uh, sort of little oval forms that might suggest eggs and creation. <laughs> 